Uh, hi, hi everyone. Welcome to um, this book launch this evening. Um, I've been doing these for well over a year now and for some reason tonight I forgot how it works. Um, so hopefully I can remember and let you know. Thank you for being here. Um, of course we're here to launch Jane Duran's new book, The Clarity of Distant Things, um, which is very exciting for us. Um, I'm really sorry that Moniza Alvi is not able to host this reading tonight. Um, so sorry if you were expecting to see her, but our very own John McAuliffe, um, who is editor and associate publisher here with us at Carcanet, has stepped in. Um, so he'll be here um, in just a second. He'll be talking with Jane later on about the book. Um, so what will happen tonight? Um, as ever, it's going to be about an hour long. Um, we can't really see you, um, but there is a chat box. Please do find it and say hi to us. Um, we'd like to hear you know where you are, where you're watching from, what you think of the reading, and um, please do say hello in there. When you use the chat, please make sure that you click on everyone so that we can all read each other's messages. Um, that'd be really good. Now, um, while Jane is reading, I'm going to show you the text on screen. Um, you're in control of your own screen, so have a play around if it doesn't suit you. And um, you should be able to make Jane's face bigger or the text bigger um, and put any queries about, about that that you've got in the chat. Um, Later on, while John and Jane are talking about the book, um, we also want you to get your own questions in. So I can see that you found the chat. Thank you, that's very cool. Um, there's also a different button. It says q and it'll open a Q&A box. Please get your questions in there lined up um, so that John can put them to Jane later on in the conversation um, towards the end of the event. Um, so, okay, um, let's launch this book. I'm gonna invite John on screen to join me and so that we can begin. Hello everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here tonight. As Jazz said, uh, I work um, as an editor and associate publisher here at Carcanet. And as part of our work each year, um, Michael and I read through the manuscripts that come in the door when it's open for submissions. Two years ago, I emailed Michael after reading the first draft of what would become um, this uh, beautiful book. And here's what I wrote. Michael, the individual poems are wonderful. And then the grid lines of the couplets accumulate. This seems especially good. How lovely breaths of life enter the gray rectangulars of the form and such interesting and suggestive images about those poems enclosures. The second half is as compelling, drawing on images and miniatures, knights and chest knights, clothing and its patterns, myrtle, lots of quote, deferential soldiers. She's doing something interesting to interesting material and it all adds up. So that was my first response to this remarkable new book. Jane is of course a poet with a long record and an established reputation, a winner of a forward prize for her first book, Breathe Now Breathe, and also the recipient of a Chumley Award for her sustained excellence as a poet. Other works have received PBS recommendations, and that includes Grace Line and American Sampler, while her wonderful edition of Lorca, the green book, as we call it in this house, is also notable um, to readers of poetry over the last couple of decades. The clarity of distant things, though, marks something of a departure. The book is comprised of two sequences, and it omits um, some of the more familiar material that our readers will know her for. I think this new book does though, deserve the observer's accolades for her previous work. Duran twists her hybrid colors into rich, sensual and perfectly controlled statements of memory and loss, they said, calling her in that review, a poet to rejoice in, which is what we are here to do tonight. So I'm going to hand over to Jane now, who's going to introduce poems from Grid Lines, the first of the um, two sequences in the book. Hello, everybody. And it's um, pretty overwhelming to see all these messages from everybody. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here and I'm thrilled to have all my friends 
from across the Atlantic and in from Spain and Israel. And um, yeah, it's very exciting. Um, I just want to thank, first of all, the Carcanet team, Michael Schmidt, Andrew Latimer, who did this beautiful um, design of my book, and, um, and uh, Jasmine, who introduced you uh, to, to this launch, and, and also to Becky Scott, and of course to John for stepping in uh, at the last minute. Thank you so much, John. So I'll start with um, reading from Gridlines. And um, this first sequence, I have two sequences in the book. Um, this first sequence is about the life and work of the North American artist, Agnes Martin. And she was born in Saskatchewan on the prairie in 1912. And her parents were early settlers. Her father was a wheat farmer. When she was 86 years old, she described the prairie and how you could see far across it. She said that the prairie was so flat that you could see the curvature of the earth and that when a train was leaving in the morning at 9 a.m., she would still see it traveling away at noon. Um, so this is called The Clarity of Distant Things. Today, the wind is bringing me a distant house, a barn, a train miles away, halted on the horizon. Each one clarified, true in miniature, and with a glint and outline of graphite, bears down on the prairie. Nowhere is far anymore. Every remote narrative makes its way forward as the pure, dry air shrinks and engraves. Agnes Martin moved to the USA in her late teens, uh, where she studied and, and she, she worked, she taught, she began to paint. Um, and when she was in her 40s, she moved to lower Manhattan to an artist community called Coenty Slip which overlooked the East River. And the artists lived in, in these lofts. Um, and it was there she began to paint um, grids. And what she said about her grids and why she started to use grids was this. She said, when I first made a grid, I happened to be thinking of the innocence of trees. And then this grid came into my mind and I thought it represented innocence, and I still do, and so I painted it, and then I was satisfied. I thought, this is my vision. So these grids were drawn over and into oil or acrylic backgrounds, and they're very powerful. I, it was extraordinary to me when I first saw an exhibition of her work at the Tate. Um, I, I was quite overwhelmed. I've never been that interested in abstract art, but um, these, these paintings were very moving. And yet, what are they? They're, they were grids, the, the, the grid paintings, that is, the grids over um, incised into paint um, or over paint and they were done in pencil, sometimes they're done with paint. Um, so, uh, grids of innocence. In her grids of innocence are grass or stone or mourning. We'll know her spring field by its fades and erasures and starlight by its columns. How can we calibrate the rose when it is strafed by intersecting lines and an urban mist of skyscrapers is blowing through and around it. Agnes Martin described herself as an abstract expressionist. She said, I believe in having my emotions recorded in the paintings and her, her, her paintings are indeed emotional. And she also felt that the paintings 
had infinite space. Um, and these grids, have you have the feeling that they go on indefinitely, way past the borders of the, of the painting. Um, so I'd like to read a poem called Friendship. And um, this poem uh, uh, is in response to the painting that's um, used for the cover of my book. It's gold leaf, incised gold leaf, and gesso on canvas. Um, this poem reflects her community of friends at Coenty's Slip, and I dedicate this poem to all the friends who are here tonight. Friendship, 1963. In late afternoon, the rooftops allied. So many golden windows, bricks, dockside warehouses, artists' river lofts. Over some, the shine is fainter, another light, another story. But elsewhere, it billows like gold leaf over gesso, scored with a grid of rectangles, seizing all the light it can capture at once as those we adore do, who we want and trust. Agnes Martin uh, spent 10 years at Coenty's Slip, and then she left. Um, she left when she was in her 50s, and she set off in a pickup truck for a solitary long journey in the west of the United States and Canada. She first um, sort of settled, her first place where she settled was in New Mexico on the Portales Mesa. It was an isolated place. It was austere. There was no electricity, no telephone, no shelter. So she started to build with her own hands on the land using adobe. So this is called One Room Adobe. <coughs> One Room Adobe. I smooth a layer of mud over the adobe walls, although the grid made by the adjoining bricks still burns through. Nothing is missing here. The high mesa rolls out pine trees for a log studio. Dirt, straw, and pine are here for the taking. Sagebrush flats, dry riverbed, no one to talk to. When you get close to um, Agnes Martin's grid paintings, she did other paintings as well later on, um, you know, with bands, just horizontal bands, but these are just, these are just, uh, the ones I'm talking about here are the grid paintings. If you get close to them, you can see how the lines sometimes waver. She was very painstaking in the way she um, drew her grids. There are little fluctuations in the line, little, little deformations. Um, but then if you stand back uh, away from the painting, the grid can sometimes disappear and you see something entirely different and it's very powerful. So this, this is perhaps the only poem which really talks a little bit about her technique and it's called Night Sea. And this is oil and gold leaf on canvas. A furtive night sea moves under and over a grid of 2,976 rectangles, a worn illusory net, gilded, surfacing and reassuring. With tiny flaws and deformations you only see if you are close up. Through the ultramarine you can glimpse reflections rising from a thin white ground made of titanium, lead, and zinc pigments. 
and below the taut linen holds the sea drift in place. But if you stand far back, the grid disappears like the occasional paintbrush hairs caught in the oils. And there is our night sea, opaque. So the last um, uh, poem I'm going to read from this sequence is called Red Bird. Not all her paintings have titles. Many of her paintings are untitled, but um, it, it's lovely when you have that title to sort of uh, give you a kind, it sort of roots you in, in some kind of a, an idea of what the poem is about. So, um, of course, I responded to all of them in a very personal way. So this next painting, um, which is called Red Bird, is um, acrylic and colored pencil on canvas. And this is a painting in which the grid seems to almost evaporate when you stand back. So it's sort of the lines coalesce, it becomes like a, a mist that you can never get through. Very hard to determine what is behind it somehow. And I, I love that uncertainty. Red Bird, 1964. Almost I can't see it. I can't see where it happens. The locality is un unsettling. A road, a noon road, a tree I keep passing. Red pencil lines, so faint, so close together, they merge and bind and staunch. A life the wind catches at, oh, one. Thanks, Jane. Really wonderful to hear those poems um, right now and to see them alongside um, uh, you you're reading them as well. Um, I thought I might begin by asking you to say something about how this project got started, about the exhibition and, 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 and wh at what point you knew it was going to be a longer sequence rather than a response to one or two of the things that you saw there. The thing about that exhibition was that I kept going back to it um, because when I stood in front of these paintings, um, I found that uh, I always take my notebook, little notebook in, in my handbag when I go on a, to an exhibition, but I found that words just came into my mind just looking at the painting and phrases occurred to me and images and it, it's not like a black, blank canvas, but in the way it is because you can bring yourself, I think everybody um, seeing a painting of, of, of Agnes Martin responds in a very personal way. And, and has their own associations. It's a bit like listening to classical music where your thoughts, you know, sort of wander and you take from it uh, things that are very personal. Um, so I kept going back and then, you know, I started writing about different paintings um, that she had done and, and the, the sequence grew like that. Um, when, and when, like one of the things that's really striking about them, of course, is you're so interested in her lines and what can emerge from the lines as you look at them and what disappears from them. And, but then the couplets of the poems and the occasional single lines that you're using, when did they become the sort of, when did you know that that form that you use so beautifully and that we, as we heard just now, as the poems kind of notice one thing and then notice the next thing over the line and make, really make us see things. When, when did those couplets and single lines become what you knew was going to work for these? Yeah, I think it, it, it... I, I'm sure it didn't happen straight away. I think I found that after a while. I wanted, I want. It, there's such a sense of space in her in her paintings, and I wanted that space to be in the poems. I wanted them to be pared down. I wanted them to suggest more than they said. In fact, the the poem Night Sea mm. is perhaps the only poem that doesn't suggest so much, you know, but the others do. So um, again, the reader can bring their own uh, personal life to them as well. 
yeah. to the poems. Well, that's another element of it, isn't it? You know, that her, her life and the, and, the, and the story of her life and her, um, her migration south and su su more southerly again um, happens across the sequence as well. And I guess that, that's a, one, of the, one of the wonderful things about the book is there is a sort of a continuity in telling the story of Agnes Martin as well. Um, when, when we're reading it. Um, I, I guess that if, I wondered if you could say something about what it is about her life, which, uh, and, and it's big open spaces that, that, that drew you in and that spoke so much to you to bring these poems about. I think, you know, because my background is American, um, I think the, the painting certainly attracted me because of that feeling of open space. And, um, something boundless about them. And, and then when I started reading about her, her life as well, she was a very private person. Um, and, uh, and I've tried to respect that in the poems. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, um, the poems, although, many, although they're about, many of them are about painting, some of them are about her life. Um, just about her life and not about a particular painting, but even the paintings uh, can sometimes suggest things about about her life, as as in the poem "Friendship." Um, but yeah, <laughs> I, um, one of the things that the title calls up, Jane, and which I thought. You know the, the the poems are very personal. You know, and they're very close to her her feeling in small spaces. But th that they're distant from you allows you to see them. And there's a sense of the, how how things which are far away, the clarity with which um, we see them and can understand their meanings, maybe um, speaks to the the confusions of what is near to us at any given moment. And I wondered if if you could talk a little bit about how how that these kind of sometimes abstract lines about how useful they were to, to talk about emotions and harder to harder to um to talk with clarity about things yeah her i think um yeah it's very interesting about distant things that the the title actually came from a talk that i heard um a, a talk by nancy prinsenthal who who is her biographer I wrote a beautiful biography of hers uh, very insightful, fascinating. Um, and but in this talk, she she was talking about um, a painting, an early painting uh, uh, by Agnes Martin about uh, of of mountains in Taos in New Mexico. And she said, and and she said, I think it. Um, what did she, what were her exact words? She said, I think it gives you the sense of the clarity of distant things in the New Mexico landscape. And that uh, phrase, the clarity of distant things, I suddenly latched onto because I thought it was such a beautiful phrase and, and so resonant. And it, it actually became resonant for both sequences. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, you, you saw in, in, the, in the painting, um, in, in, in the poem about Night Sea, when you stand away, you then see this kind of, dark night of the soul you see the night sea you see what we all don't understand about life and death and um the condition of of just the human condition somehow it just becomes so much uh, larger uh, and then when you get close up you you see different things you see that bridge you see the human touch yeah. um so yeah, and the clarity also um, spills into the next sequence as well. This idea of clarity, you can have uh, distant things can be distant in the past. Um, and you can see them suddenly very clearly. You can see moments from your own past suddenly very clearly. Um, yeah. And understand yourself better maybe a decade, decades later. Uh, understand why yeah. you did some, something or why you felt something or understand someone who was close to you who at the time maybe you hadn't understood completely. So it, it has the two things. It has that. And clarity also has the feeling of light. It has the feeling of illumination. And that's why 
it spilled over into the next sequence as well. I, I wonder if you could say something about, about the two sequences, about the order in which they were written and when you knew that they were going to fit in this way, Jane. I start the the second sequence actually I I took on rather deliberately because um, my lovely sister Chelly suggested that I write about Alain Dalouz. Mm. Um, I think it was also I was also thinking of not writing so much about myself and about you know things that are more autobiographical. Um, but so it was like uh, it, it was a sort of project and and when i um i was very inspired uh by these little miniatures which were um made during the uh, 13th century they were called the the canticles of um of uh, the virgin mary the cantigas de santa maria and um this is an illuminate these are illuminated um uh, poems and songs uh, commissioned by um, Alfonso X, the Christian king. So, yeah, the, these these illuminations um, were well. It's just a whole world apart from Agnes Martin. There's not the two sequences are completely uh, un, unrelated on on the surface. Um, uh, but, uh, there's, yeah, there's a great sense of figures in space in both of them, though, I think. Uh, maybe, Jenny, would you like to uh, take us uh, into the next sequence and maybe read some poems from that sequence? And I see there are already a couple of questions in the Q&A, but please um, uh, do pop other questions in because um, we're going to have a little time to chat further after, after, we, um, after we hear from Jane again now. Right. Um, so the, the sequence uh, is about Al-Andalus, which was the Arabic name given to Islamic Iberia in the Middle Ages. Um, and it offers um, just glimpses, really, of Al-Andalus, uh, starting from the invasion um, of Iberia uh, by a, a, a Berber and Arab army. Um, that, who set off from North Africa um, in, seven, in the year 711. And then seven centuries of um, Muslim um, governance in, in uh, Spain. Well, at that time, um, it was a peninsula. It was Iberia. It, it included Portugal and uh, present-day Spain and present-day Portugal. So, um, in this first poem, uh, oh, I just wanted to say something about these miniatures um, that were in these cantigas, um, is that they are, the cantigas, they're, they're poems, they recount the miracles of the Virgin Mary. And, um, and they're, the, the miniatures are, are like, in, they're in panels and, and they're, um, and they illustrate these poems. So they have, they give an alternative sort of visual narrative. And, um, but they also show so much about uh, different aspects of life during medieval Iberia and, and including battle scenes between Christians and Muslims. So um, they're very stylized. Uh, in the first poem, I, I imagine uh, creating a miniature to illustrate that um, moment of departure uh, of the Berber and Arab army from North Africa, from the shores of North Africa, um, headed by Tariq ibn Ziyad. And it's called Crossing to Hispania 7-Eleven. And I'm imagining making this miniature of that moment. To conjure the hour of departure, press Tariq ibn Ziyad, his soldiers, horses, spears, and banners close together on ships tossing cheerfully side by side and scale them down many times. Paint the illuminated wind, the open strait, small and confined, as if held in the palm of a child's hand. 
erase all terror, hope, or ambition, each one vast and morbid, from the faces of the soldiers, so they are stern and eager to a man, ready for the night crossing ahead and a candle flame of land. So um, right up from 711, right through the 11th century, um, really most of Iberia had been conquered and was under Islamic rule. Um, but especially during the early centuries and, and especially during the first few centuries, there was a, a very, very rich um, cultural life and scholarship. And in, it wasn't a melting pot. You wouldn't have called it a melting pot, but it, in which Jews, Christians, and Muslims all participated. And uh, this, this happened during um, the period of Umayyad rule and uh, where the capital was Cordoba. And at that time, there was uh, a religious tolerance and uh, a somewhat peaceful coexistence. But the lovely thing was that there was this blending of, um, there was a, such a collaboration, there was such a participation across the religions in the culture. So Cordoba. All the prismatic illusion, Jew, Christian, Muslim, gardens and inner courtyards, inner, the inner man, striding or stumbling into light and radio encounters in streets and marketplaces, a glance, a warm greeting. Um, in one of the, I, I don't know whether it was the last interview Lorca gave, but certainly it, it was um, towards the end of his life. It was a month before he was assassinated. He was asked by the interviewer um, about the surrender of Granada in, 19, in 1492. And this was his answer. He said, it was an evil moment despite what they teach us in schools. An admirable civilization was lost, a poetry, an astronomy, an architecture, and a refinement unique in all the world. So the arts and sciences flourished in Al-Andalus um, and really right through to, to the end, you know, right through to the Nasrid, um, kingdom, but over the centuries, many thousands of A Arabic manuscripts were lost or destroyed. Um, the only surviving miniatures from Al Andalus itself, we have the Christian miniatures from um, Alfonso X, but um, the only um, ones that have come to light from Al Andalus are from the love story. Hadith Bayad wa Riyadh. Um, but the refinement of these miniatures uh, suggests to scholars that there was an elaborate tradition and craft um, highly developed in Al Andalus. Um, the, the love story um, of, of um, Bayad wa Riyadh is about a merchant called Bayad and a handmaiden called Riyad. And of course, there are all sorts of terrible obstacles to their love, um, but they, um, they sing and they play the, the lute called the oud to, to each other. And, and the miniatures are very beautiful and show wonderful architecture of the, of the palace and um, a water wheel and different aspects of, um, of, of life. And, and were probably um, uh, painted during the Almohad period. Um, so here's the poem, it's called Bayad, 
So this is the, the, the young merchant who is in love with Riyadh. <clears throat> a young man in love lies on blades of grass without crushing them, one arm outstretched, his turban unraveling. His hand too is expressive, delicate, draped over the water where vertical black and green river lines pursue each other. Two cypresses are dense with a pungent inner life. An inky water wheel is in the foreground, but it is small as if it were actually in the distance, lifting and dripping water as it rotates and creaks. So um, over the centuries, the um, Islamic rule was eroded and uh, by internal discord, among other things, and, and of course, successive battles with Christian armies. And um, the recapture of territories by the Christian armies was known as the Reconquista, the Reconquest. <coughs> so I'll read my poem, my little poem, Reconquest, which is very much based on um, the miniatures. Uh, from the Cantigas. It falls to each soldier to be wide-eyed and resolute in the stillness, the peace of a miniature, where the clash of shield and sword, horse and sky, is always harmonious and exacting, silently endured. So that, um, that reconquest led to the final surrender of Granada, uh, led to the exile of many thousands of Jews, mass forced conversions of Muslims, and finally the expulsion of Muslims from the peninsula. So this last poem offers scattered images of exile and memories of Al-Andalus. And it's called Among the Clarities. What happens to perception when the night reclaims what is scattered? Even church bells can throw stones and the early morning wind goad you. I dig my fingers into the rind of an orange, but the fruit is powdery. The sacked libraries, burned books, the fiery river. A girl recklessly places one drop from it behind each ear. The voice of a muezzin, church bells, or the shema, each has its own quiet afterwards. Along the riverbank, the turning water wheels are glorious, the valley lucent. A leather binding of a Quran, maybe a door, a central eight pointed star, strap work and gold leaf, so much to preoccupy the eye and breath. Stout breezes by the Wadiana and the Guadalquivir, a last refuge in the Alpujarras, night, its lanterns and listeners. A fish struggles through turquoise spiral waves, surges, a coastline, then no coastline, wind, then no wind, blue smoke, carrion, whether the cry of a baby or the cries of seagulls, both tear the air. Riyadh takes the oud in her arms and sings among the clarities, each illumination is too close to bear. So great to hear those poems, Jane.
And uh, again, I've got to ask you a question that I didn't tell you I was going to ask you now, but it's when, you know, the image of the candle flame of land that comes up at the end of the wonderful Hispania poem, or when the river turns into a drop behind the girl, the drops behind the girl's ears. And the images are just so amazing. And there's something about the form that seems to make space um, around the images so that they just, they really land with just such effect, I think, um, listening to the poems um, and reading them. And, I, and this is, a, again, it's a terrible question, but have you, uh, is, is painting or, or visual art something you've also, uh, is something you've also worked at the way you think about space and images or? How do you mean? I, have you have is painting something and draw is it is is there a visual art element in your practice as well or is it no no not at all no 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 okay because it's, it's, <laughs> it's amazing how the images just really work in the frame of the poem um or outside the frame of the poem in a couple of the poems where the foot sneaks out but um yeah uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat and one of them is about how if you didn't know Agnes Martin's work the poems stand on their own two feet. There's such vividness in them. And I think, um, I think that, that really matters, I suppose, that the paintings, the question is that you see them as points of departure rather than something to which the poem is aiming. Does that, does that make? Ab absolutely, yes, yes. And, I, and I, on purpose, I put the details of, of the underneath the title you know, if it was painted on acrylic or it was painted with graphite, the, the lines were made with graphite. So, um, yeah, I wanted to sort of conjure the painting in that way rather than, yeah. you know, just have it as a poem. Very good. Um, I, I guess this is a sort of, it's a, it's a related question, but I think it also speaks to what the two sequences have in common. And it's to do with some of the formal choices across both of them, which is, you know, even that image of the candle flame of land or the drop from the river, they are themselves miniatures. Um, and about, you know, formally, Agnes Martin's lines in her grids um, and the lines of your poems, and then the images that you're drawing in, um, in the minute in the Al Andalus poems, formally, um, how, how, do, how, do, how did the form of the second sequence come about? When, when did you know it was going to be a sequence as well and how it was no, going to fit because, together? Uh, yeah, as it, one never can remember exactly when these things were, were, were decided, but it, it did evolve that way. It evolved so that um, the poems were pared down and um, sort of undecorated in a way. I mean, so that they just had lots of, space and suggestion and silence running through them and around them. Um, and I did get into that form generally of having couplets um, because I thought that was that was useful. Not all of them have couplets, but most of them do. Yeah. Um, so, so those questions were from Beverly Brahek and, and Michael Schmidt, um, kind of just, uh, you know, as you might imagine, thinking about the poem's forms as they're as they're reading uh, reading along with them, um, Michael also asks about punctuation and about you know the way that you do use commas and line breaks. But at what point did you decide to omit full stops? When when, when did that become apparent that you were going to do that in the poems? Yeah. I, I yes, I I sort of I got a pattern going. I started with a small letter, always the poem with a lowercase. Um, I had no full stops at the end of any line or commas or anything at the end of any line, except if there was a question mark needed, yeah. then I had to do that. But otherwise I would have commas in the middle of lines, that was fine. And I would use a capital letter for, um, in a sense, a new sentence rather than a full stop and then a capital letter. So you could tell, um, yeah. yeah. But it slows, it, you know, having these couplets slows the whole poem down, you know. Yeah, it creates such space in the poems. You know, some of the poems might be 25 or 30 words, but it feels like there's a whole world contained in them. Um, there's a question here from Graham Henderson and Graham says, wonderful poems. Um, and does the clarity of distant things also reflect the privileged role that poetry can play in the making of human meanings? 
about what it is that poetry does. Um, oh, for sure, yeah. yes, for sure. Yes, I think, yeah, I think, you know, all these things work right across the board. I mean, when you think of what Agnes Martin is doing, it's quite similar to what poets do. And she would wait for her inspiration and we wait for our inspiration and, you know, all, all these things, um, all, all, all these, there are all these sort of cross, cross currents. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Robert Setter asks if the poems or if the putting together of the book was affected at all by the last two years of lockdown. I think I could answer that too, Jane, but do you want to, it certainly speaks to lockdown feeling some of it, but. Do you know what? I really was able to develop the second sequence because of lockdown. I, I had the time, um, I had the, you know, we were all enclosed and, <laughs> Um, and and it, and I was able to focus on that really a lot, um, which was good because when I first sent it to Carcanet, it was a, a smaller sequence, yeah. but it expanded, and it also expanded to include other elements, not not just uh, miniatures. It it includes artifacts, I you know, and it includes I I even. Um, read sections of agricultural treatises that were translated, you know, from Al-Andalus, because you had mm. wonderful agronomists there and botanists. And um, so there are two poems about um, two agriculturalists. Um, they were great scholars as well. They used, you know, um, the scholarship of agriculture from Greek times and they drew on all, it was an amazing culture going on. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your whole question. I think that is good. And I, I do think, <laughs> I do think there, is a, there is a sort of amazing sense of being brought to another world, which certainly for this reader, it was such an absolute pleasure to visit these places um, in the poems. They're so vividly brought to life. And there is something, it's almost like, it's, it's almost like you're, you're there, Manish, but there is a sense of you, you're catching people at a moment in their lives but there's something eternal about their activities um, in, in that moment that you catch them at. Yeah. I, did, I did want to ask you another kind of contemporary question, which is about how um, the poem's interest in mixed cultures and in migration. And of course, this speaks to the first sequence too, and about how the pressures of migration and the the ways in which religion is abused and abused in our kind of our, the, the culture that we're that we're that those of us in the in the West are now part of. How how do you how does that get into the poems? And was it on your mind and the pressure that exerted on trying to write this other culture into into the poems? Do you know it was so much in my mind, especially with the second sequence, um, <clears throat> all the problems with refugees and. Um, the boats and the boat people and migrations. Um, and I just felt also, I wanted so much to kind of highlight um, really what was accomplished in Al-Andalus and the Muslim culture and as a sort of counterbalance to all the difficulties we're having now, you know. Um, Yes, but the migration thing is very important. It's important in my own family. Um, it, you know, we, we, we're all, we've all migrated. Um, I migrated from the United States. My father was, went into exile after the Spanish Civil War. He never returned uh, to Spain. He never could return to Spain. And he, when he was ready to, and it was possible for him, he, he died a few weeks before. Um, he was able to do that. And so, you know, it's, um, yeah. Um, my husband oh. is Algerian, so he's migrated from Algeria. Mm. My son was, uh, our son was born in Algiers. Mm. So, you know, we're a family of uh, some migrations. Uh, yeah, I wonder if maybe this is a sort of another question following on from that is how this book um, feels to you in relation to your other work in terms of its continuities with what you've been writing um, since Breathe Now Breathe and, it, and its difference? Yeah, I, I think Breathe Now Breathe 
was written over a period of about eight years, lots of different, um, lots of different one-off poems. Uh, after, after Breathe Now Breathe, I started writing sequences and I've never turned back. I, I, I just find sequences so much more interesting. I, I find the depth you can go to um, in writing a sequence is so fascinating. And I love the, the relationship between the poems in a sequence and the way they speak to each other. Um, so, but I think I've become, my poems have become more um, sort of bare and, and sort of, I, I don't know, much more pared down um, since, I, I think it started when I wrote Silences from the Spanish Civil War because I, I thought of silences as being part of the poems. And, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, each, each book I've written is different. From the others. Um, there's a, a little bit of a follow-up question on this from Sharon Morris, who, who asks if your use of syntax has changed much, or if you have a sense of the different kinds of sentences you're writing in this book. Um, I'm very aware of syntax. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether my 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 feeling for syntax. I think. What's interesting is because I'm not using punctuation, um, yeah, the syntax has to be really, um, really clear. There has to be a real clarity there. Um, I don't have punctuation to help me. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny that you say it's bare because it does seem to this reader that the poems are are really rich as well, though, that there is a how the images are set up alongside one another. It doesn't. Um, it, I, I know what you mean in terms of it. There's great clarity in how you, you're, you're laying them out. But there, you know, there are so many, so many memorable images in the poems that we've heard tonight um, and across the book as well. Jane, I, I have a feeling we might be. Um, we're going to be finishing up in a minute or two. Um, so I wondered if we might inveigle you into reading one more poem um, before we finish up. And I think at that point, Jazz will be in a position behind the scenes to remind everybody about other things that are coming um, and about how to, how to buy copies of the, of the book. Um, but it's been a real pleasure to hear you talking about the poems, Jane. And, uh, Lovely to hear them. Oh. John, thank you so much for hosting the, the launch and for your words at the beginning. And it's just been a, a delight. And thank you to everyone for listening in. I'm so glad you, I feel your presence, even though I can't see you. So I'll, I'll finish with a, a short poem, which um, ends the sequence of miniatures of Alain Dalou's and it's called Red Earth. In my hands, I take that red earth that crops up everywhere, crumbles and clings. I see it here and there in vineyards or running with the urine of horses on dirt roads. Its light is in the red tiles on the roofs of long farms and in the clay terrain of ceramic bowls and oil lamps. It is the idea of staying, a grant of earth, the earth I interrupt now with my hands. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jane. Um, it was such a pleasure to hear you read those and, and so much context um, given to us tonight in your conversation. So thank you very, very much. And thanks to John for hosting um, and for having that conversation this evening. Thank you so much for being such an engaged audience. Um, it's been so cool to see all your messages in the chat um, and for all your wonderful questions. Um, please go and buy the book if you don't have a copy. Um, obviously you paid your two pounds, you will get two pounds off the book. Um, I am putting the code and the link in the chat for you as well. Um, and you'll get an automatic email from Zoom tomorrow and it'll have all the same info in it. But if you have any problems, just drop me an email um, and we'll get you a copy of the book together. So um, that's everything, really. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and congratulations, of course, Jane, on the new book. Um, 
next week we are launching Sherry Benning's uh, new poetry collection um, called Field Requiem. Um, she's going to be joined by Karen Soley. So um, that is at 7 p.m. next Wednesday and all the details are on our website. So please have a look there um, and join us again. I'm going to just leave the chat open for you for a couple of minutes so you can get your last minute messages in there. Um, but that's everything from us. So thank you all and good night. <laughs>